Okay, good morning. Um, I, I want to spend about five minutes talking about the baryon acoustic oscillation feature and then, um, and then work, uh, spending the rest of our time on gravitational lensing. So you, you learn from uh, Nalima that um, in before recombination, the photons and electrons and protons were, uh, were, had these, underwent these acoustic oscillations. So if you plotted the um, power spectrum of the baryons as a function of wave number, you know, she showed it in 2D, but if you plot it in 3D at the time of recombination, divided by some smooth spectrum, it would look uh, like this. You know, you'd have essentially oscillations, 100% oscillations, right, around some, around some mean thing. When, uh, after the... Uh, uh, baryons, electrons and, electrons and protons stop talking to the um, photons, they stop oscillating, and they fall into the uh, dark matter potential wells. So the baryons uh, fall into the, the, the phi from dark matter. And we, we've, we've talked a lot about how the power spectrum of dark matter lo looks like. It's a, it's a very smooth spectrum. So essentially what happens is you have these 100% oscillations that are, that are imprinted on, a, on a, a species that has much greater energy density and, and much, larger, uh, much larger perturbations, so these get washed out significantly. So at the end of the day, what the, what the total spectrum looks like, that, you know, the baryons give some of these oscillations to the full matter because everything, the baryons and the dark matter now are basically behaving together. And so the full power spectrum... Um, divided by some smooth spectrum, is uh, looks something like this. With instead of 100% oscillations, you know, a few percent, whatever, 2% oscillations or something like that. So, and that's simply because there's a lot more dark matter and those perturbations are much greater than the baryon thing. Right? It's, it's a very simple thing to understand. The, that's the true power spectrum of matter divided by the smooth power spectrum. So I'm just trying to highlight the features. So if I would draw it on the you know, power section we showed yesterday, you might barely be able to see it. You know, just small, these small wiggles and stuff. Okay, so there are actually, with, and, and another way to think about it is in, the, the, in real space. So in real space, it shows up, you, you know, this is what typically happens. If you have like a sine wave in, in uh, Fourier space, in real space, it shows up as just a bump. So in some ways, it's more prominent in real space. We know what the real space thing is. It's the correlation function. We know that's falling off roughly 1 over r squared. So if you plot r squared times the correlation function as a function of r, it looks something like this. So that's a pretty, you know, pretty significant feature. And that feature is determined completely by the, uh, the sound horizon at, de at um, decoupling, right? That, that's the scale. And we know, we've met, we know what that scale is. You've probably calculated it yourself. And we've measured it in the CMB. So we know that scale exactly. It's 150 megaparsec. So this, th this is a tool we can now use to learn about cosmological distances. And there are two ways to do that. We can measure the, um, the transverse uh, BAO signal. And what I mean by that is we're sitting over here, and we look at the galaxy distribution, and there's going to be some feature, and that feature is going to have a, a, a length of you know, the sound horizon, 150 megaparsec, right? And all we have to do is uh, see what angle that feature subtends on the sky. So we measure theta, we know RS, and that enables us to determine the distance out to the, you know, galaxy sample we're looking at. So this is a simple way of getting distances as a function of redshift. And by the way, you know people won the Nobel Prize for doing this with supernova, so this is another way to do that, independent. And it's quickly overtaking, actually, supernova as being the most powerful way to get, um, to get the distance redshift relationship. A second way to do that is to do that um, radially. And, and of course, th these two are combined in, some way, in, in most cases. And in that case, what you're doing is you're looking at the same feature but on, in the radial direction, right? So this is the same thing. This is RS. And the thing, to, the, the thing to remember here is that what we measure is a delta Z. That is a, 
a difference in a redshift of the, of the, you know, the, of the feature. Feature appears uh, have a size of order delta z. So how is that related to R s? So remember that um, that um, R s any physical distance and any co-moving distance is just the physical distance. I'll put in the c for a second, which is c d t divided by the scale factor. And remember, just before let's get rid of the c's. This is d a over a a dot, and that's equal to uh, d a over a squared h. So you've seen this before. And then when you switch to redshift, remember a is roughly 1 over z. So dA over a is dz over z, and, and the a is a z, so that kills that. So this is just equal to delta z over h of z. So what does that mean? What that means is when you measure the size of the feature in the radial direction in terms of redshift, you measure this. You know this. You can infer not just the distances, but you can infer the um, the actual value of the expansion rate directly at at earlier redshifts. That is the most one of the most direct ways to measure how the how fast the universe was expanding in the past. Any questions about BAL? What is delta z? D, um, so remember that a is equal to one over one plus z. Z is the redshift. Other questions? Good. OK, so let's talk about gravitational lensing. And, uh, and, and the first thing I want to introduce is to, to uh, piggyback on what Manoj did yesterday and introduce the distortion tensor. So remember, Manoj told you that there is this um, lens equation, which gives you the unlensed position in terms of the lens position minus the derivative with respect to some projected potential with respect to theta. So what do these things mean? This is the position that you would see if there was no deflection. That's where you would see it, the unlensed position. So, the un, uh, so the un, by lens, I mean the light has been distorted. So. That, that's what I mean by lensing. So this is the unlensed position on the sky. It's a 2D position on the sky. And this is the actual observed position, or the lens position. And if there's no gravitational potential, or if the gravitational potential doesn't vary across the sky, if it's constant, no problem. Then this just vanishes, and you get no lensing, right? If you have a constant gravitational potential, it does nothing. So you need the gravitational potential to vary. This thing is not, as Manoj pointed out, is not actually the, the 3D gravitational potential that we, we've talked about, that obeys the Poisson equation. Rather, it's a line of sight integral of the 3D thing. And in particular, it's defined as follows. If you integrate those equations, as Manoj asked you to do, it is equal to 2 divided by the distance to the source the integral from 0 to the distance to the source, you integrate over all uh, lens distances. So I'm integrating out all the way to the source over all distances of all possible lenses. I modulate this, um, this integral with uh, the distance between the source and the lens divided by the distance to the lens. And then I, um, I, I, I calculate the the 3D gravitational potential, that's the one that we've been talking about, right? That obeys the Poisson equation, et cetera, et cetera. That one at a function, uh, at the position x, where x is the same thing we did before. Let's just use the small angle approximation. So the radial, the transverse part is exactly what we did yesterday. It's equal to dl theta. And this is changing as you're moving along the line of sight, right? So you just, this is very simple. You're just evaluating the potential everywhere along the line of sight. And so as you, as you change dl, you're evaluating the potential at different positions. And the, the transverse position changes like that. And the radial position just changes like that. Does that make sense? OK, so that is the, that's the gravitational potential. So if you look at this equation, the lens equation, and so, so the, 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 the reason why we're spending a full lecture on this and why people are so captivated by lensing is that for the first time in astronomy, we have the potential of not measuring things that light up, 
which trace the underlying mass in complicated ways. Remember, you, we can make predictions for the mass distribution, right? If we just measure galaxies, we have to figure out how galaxies are related to mass, and that's hard. But this is really directly probing the mass distribution. It doesn't care whether it's dark matter or baryons or, what, or whatever. It's probing whatever is contributing to the gravitational potential. That's why one thing I hate is um, you'll often see uh, press releases about lens, lensing results, and they say this is a map of dark matter. I hate that because it's not a map of dark matter. It's a map of the gravitational potential. It's a map of all matter. It's not, I, they're saying it because dark matter, they think, is most of the matter, so fine. But, but it's not, anyway, even in that, even if, even if the dark matter is most of matter, it's not just singling out the dark matter, right? It's getting everything. So, so don't do that. Anyway, um, okay, so, so that's the um, projected gravitational potential. A and uh, if you look at this equation, it, 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 it ca calls out for you to, um, to, to uh, exploit the fact or, or the problem that Manoj mentioned. That is, when you look at a thing in the sky, th this equation tells you that it's not really where you think it is. But that doesn't really help you because you don't know where it's supposed to be, right? So this equation by itself doesn't, for the most part, doesn't help you very much. What does help you, though, is the following. If you take the derivative of this equation, this, remember these are 2D um, quantities. This is the 2D position, 2D position. This is a, a function that depends only on the 2D angular position, right? And it depends only on the position on the sky, and we're dealing in flat space, so it's just x and y. Right? We're not doing the full curve thing. So anyway, so then these indices now, these uh, Latin indices are now, um, are now um, run from 1 to 2. So d beta, d theta, d beta i, d theta j, that's a 2 by 2 matrix. Right? And we know what the first term is. The first term is just uh, a chronic delta. And the second term is what's called the distortion tensor. Psi ij. So this is called the distortion tensor. And this quantifies the extent to which the, um, the, the extent to which uh, uh, the, the light, light, is, uh, light propagation is affected. So this is a 2 by 2, a spin 2 tensor. And it has a, a deep uh, uh, analogies to the polarization tensor that, that um, Nalima talked to you about. And just like in, in polarization, they use this QU stuff. So in, uh, in lensing, we have slightly different notation. So this is a 2 by 2 tensor, and this is where we parametrize it. So the trace of this tensor is equal to 2 times kappa. Kappa is called the convergence. And gamma 1 and gamma 2 are called the two components of shear. So kappa is called the convergence. And gamma 1 and gamma 2 are the two sh components of shear. So in, in, just to, in terms of the polarization stuff, the um, kappa would be something like the intensity. And gamma 1 and gamma 2 would be uh, uh, Q and U, essentially. Right? Yeah, uh, okay. You mean not, not for polarization? Okay, so for, uh, um, I don't know, that's, that's a good question, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 actually, I, I should know. I think, I think probably the answer is yes, but, I, but I'm not sure. Yeah. OK, so um, let's try to get a physical feel for what these quantities are. So let's imagine uh, a circular source, uh, an unlen a, a source that, if it was unlensed, would be circular. So that um, beta 1 squared plus beta 2 squared is just a constant. Let's call it, I don't know, r squared. Let's call it, uh, let's call it, um, B squared. So it's just a constant, okay? So it's a, cir it's a circular thing, right? What happens to the image of the thing <coughs> that we actually see? So let's first look at um, kappa and not equal to zero, but gamma 1 and gamma 2 equal to zero. Right, so no shear, but just convergence. So what's going to happen? Let's write down these equations. 
So then d beta 1 d theta 1 is equal to 1 minus kappa, right? And similarly, d beta 2 d theta 2 is the same thing. So you get a 1 minus kappa. So if you solve this, this means that beta i, both of them have the same equation, is just equal to 1 minus kappa times theta i. So that means if you take beta 1 squared plus beta 2 squared, and that's just equal to a constant b squared, that is equal to 1 minus kappa squared times theta squared. So if you have a circle, an uh, initially unlensed thing that looks like this, if kappa is greater than 0, this is going to be is going to be less than zero. Is it le sorry, less than one, right? Let's say there's point one, and then this is one, one, there's point nine squared, so it's a sm less, less than one. So in order to keep this thing equal to b, theta's got to be bigger than b, right? So if kappa is greater than zero, um, you get an enlarged object. And similarly, if kappa is less than zero, you get a, you get a, a smaller object. So this is magnifying it, or contracting the image. Does that make sense? The thing that Manoj mentioned yesterday is actually the light that comes per, per area is constant. So when you make a thing bigger, you also get more light from it. So that's what he in, defined by the magnification. It turns out uh, the magnification is essentially proportional to this convergence. Okay. Let's look at the next case. Kappa equal gamma 2 equal 0 and gamma 1 not equal to 0. Why is surface uh, intensity, uh, why is brightness conserved? Um, it's a theorem that I'm not good at. I, I don't know. There, there should be some reason. There's a good reason. For, um, yeah, you could, you could um, we could prove it. <laughs> okay, we don't have enough time to write on the margins of the paper. Okay, so um, no, it's not that hard. It's very, very easy. Okay, but anyway, so uh, l good question. The um, so what happens in this case where where you don't have that, and the and the and where you have a kappa and gamma two equal to zero, then what happens is the following. It's the same equation. So d beta one, d theta one. D beta 1 and theta 2, and the other way is still 0. So this is equal to 1 minus kappa, sorry, 1 minus gamma 1 theta 1. And d beta 2, d theta 2, is equal to 1 plus gamma 1 theta 2. Right? If you look at this equation over there, when gamma, uh, the, um, it's 1 minus gamma 1 in top for the, for the first 1, 1 component. And the 2, 2 component is, is 1 plus, plus, is a minus, a minus. So it's plus gamma 1. Thank you. And so what that means is that uh, beta 1, when you integrate, is equal to 1 minus gamma 1 theta 1. And uh, beta 2 is 1 plus gamma 1 theta 2. And what that means is, when you square this again, you have this constant value, b squared, is equal to 1 minus gamma 1 squared theta 1 squared, plus 1 plus gamma 1 squared theta 2 squared. So again, if you start with a ball like this, so this is the unlensed thing. So let's look when theta 2 is 0 along this axis then the only way to keep this constant, since if gamma 1 is, say, greater than 0, so this is a smaller number. If gamma 1 is greater than 0, this is a smaller number. So along this axis, when theta 2 is 0, theta 1's got to be bigger, right? So uh, it's got to be like this. And then similarly, when uh, theta 1 is 0, the only way to keep this constant is theta 2's got to be smaller, right? So, uh, so it looks something like this. It gets distorted like this. This is for gamma 1 uh, greater than 0. So what you get is a circular ga galaxy, galaxy, 
gets distorted to be um, uh, elliptical. And then similarly, if gamma 1 is less than 0, the exact reverse happens, and you get a system like this. Right, just, this, just reverse the argument. Does that make sense? So I'm going to ask you as an exercise to do the same thing for gamma 2 not equal to 0. And what you find is um, the, um, it's, it's a 45 degree angle. So this is gamma 2 greater than 0. And this is gamma 2 uh, less than 0. OK? So the, the bottom line is that if you measure, and this is the key takeaway, so measure the shapes. of uh, background galaxies. And that enables you to infer uh, gamma 1 and gamma 2, the components of shear. Now, you could also imagine measuring the magnification of background galaxies. But again, that's a little bit hard because you don't know how bright they're supposed to be. Having said that, that, the idea of using magnification to do this is re-emerging. And I think it actually might become more and more important because this line here, uh, there are about, let's say, about 50 people in the world who spend their whole careers doing this, figuring out how to measure shapes of galaxies. It's very complicated. And as you go further away, as you go to deeper and deeper, galaxies are less and less resolved, so it becomes harder and harder. Bri measuring the brightness of something is much easier. So as you go far away, it's possible that magnification may become the best way to do the, to infer things like the convergence or the or the shear. Yeah. Ah, good good point. Good point. Um, okay. So. Um, Let's imagine you have, in a given pixel, where the, where the so this shear, what is the shear? The shear is a property of, of uh, the mass along the line of sight, right? So imagine you measure lots and lots of different galaxies in a given region, a given pixel. So you measure 100 galaxies in a square, in a square arc minute. So, and that, so the shear for all those galaxies is roughly the same. Now, some of those galaxies will have a shape intrinsically without any, uh, without any lensing, without shapes like this. Even if they were spherical, they might, even if they were, um, even, well, if they're spherical, even if, even if they're completely circular, if they're disk galaxies, right, we might see them edge on. So then they'd look like this, right? And then some of them will look like this, and some will be kind of circular, and some will look like this. Just randomly, they'll have all kinds of random shapes, right? So the way to think about that is this intrinsic shape is noise, right? If you just plotted it without lensing, if you just plotted the lensing and measured, say, gamma 1, the shape gamma 1, you get a distribution that looks something like this. You get like a, roughly a Gaussian distribution. Some of them would be like this, some like this, some like that, some like that, right? Yeah, Caitlin. OK, let's come back to that. Um, because let me just develop this, and then we'll get. It doesn't surprise me that you're ahead of me, but anyway, but you are ahead of me. OK, so anyway, so the distribution is, uh, is, is it, 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 you get the point, is that if there were unlensed, it would look like this. Do you agree? OK, so, so what that means is well, well, it's noise. So, but we know how to deal with noise. What do we do? We just measure lots of different objects. So if you measure 100 galaxies, then the noise gets reduced significantly, right? And underlying the noise is a signal, right? So for those galaxies that you can't see it here, but, but well, you could see here, but, but if, you, if there was a signal there, if there was a non-zero gamma 1, then that noise would be centered around the true value of the signal, right? So that's the bottom line. You have to, you have to beat down the noise in that way. Does that make sense? Does everyone see that? OK, so what Caitlin said is the biggest one, is one of the three biggest systematics in lensing. It's called intrinsic alignment. That is, there are tidal forces that tend to make 
uh, galaxies that are close to one another, they're in the same gravitational field, so they tend to be aligned. They often tend to be aligned with one another. Physically, how that happens? There's a beautiful paper by Roger Blandford about 20 years ago, that or maybe roughly 15 to 20 years ago, that gives a beautiful model for it. But the fact is we really don't know what how that is. So that's an interesting topic for, for, for people. So, the, the, so that, what that does, what your point does, is it breaks down the intrinsic assumption, the implicit assumption, that each one of these things is drawn from a Gaussian distribution. It's not true, right? Because if all of them, are, let's say they're all completely intrinsically aligned, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be that way. So, so that's a very important systematic that people have to deal with. And in fact, it's worse than that for the following reason. Um, the, um, so imagine you have, we're sitting over here, right? And you have a background galaxy that looks like this. Now its shape is going to be determined by this foreground mass, right? Its distortion will be determined by this foreground mass, right? But then in this plane, there'll be a galaxy that might be stretched because it's being pulled towards this foreground mass, right? So when you come to cross-correlate the shape of this guy with the shape of this guy, even though they have nothing, to, they're nowhere near each other, there's, a, there's, a, there's an intrinsic alignment between those, those things too. And this turns out to be actually the bigger, bigger uh, problem. So both of these things are problems, but, but, so, so we're aware of it, but you're right, it's a big problem. Other questions? Okay, two very good questions, very good points. Okay. So having said that, I just want to, that there, you pointed out there are problems, and there are big problems, but let's get back to the, to the allure of it. What, what do we get if we can do this? So let's just focus on the promise first. The, um, the promise is, is, is really remarkable. So let's, um, let's think about it in, let's think about it in terms of, uh, let's do it this way. Let, let, let's look in Fourier space. So in Fourier space, the derivatives, uh, sorry, before I go to Fourier space. Um, so, so what are these things? The, the um, kappa is, if you look at the definition of kappa, over there in the distortion tensor, right? This is equal to the second derivative of the potential with respect to theta, right? So, so, the, so let me just say it the different way. Um, psi ij is defined to be, someone tell me if it's plus or minus, the second derivative of phi with respect to theta i, theta j. I think it's, it's plus, right? Thank you. Okay, so what that means is, for example, kappa is equal to um, is equal to the one half the uh, the two D Laplacian of phi. Because if you uh, if you if you take the f uh, the derivative respect to theta one squared plus the derivative respect to theta two squared, psi one one plus psi two two is uh, is two kappa, right? So I, so I think I got that right. And similarly, etc. And similarly, gamma one is. Uh, tell me if I got the one half right. I think I did. Is uh, the derivative with respect to uh, theta x squared minus the derivative with respect to theta y squared? Did I get the the one half right? Um, if I take x x psi x x minus psi y y, I get two. Yeah. Okay. And then and then similarly, uh, gamma two is uh, is not one half. It's the second derivative of phi with respect to theta x theta y. Okay. So so what is that? What is that? What's the point of that? So now go to Fourier space. So you know in Fourier space, derivatives go to L, factors of L, right? If you're, it, the conjugate var variable to the angle. So that means kappa twiddle is equal to, when you take two derivatives, you get an I squared, which is minus I. So it's minus L squared over 2 times phi twiddle. 
gamma 1 twiddle, again, it's a minus a half. There's a minus a half. I'll do this one a little bit slowly. There is a phi twiddle. And then there's an Lx squared minus Ly squared. Right, so L is in a 2D plane in Fourier space. There's an X component and a Y component. If we wrote the 2D plane in terms of polar coordinates, this would be L squared cosine squared uh, phi minus L squared sine squared phi, where phi is the angle that the angle the vector L makes with an arbitrary X axis. So this is equal to minus L squared over 2 phi twiddle. And remember, we were some of us were talking at that. Uh, that cafe, there's really only one identity we need to know in trigonometry, and it's this one, and it's equal to cosine 2 phi. Right? Actually, it turns out there's another one you have to know, and the only other identity you need to know, you could have skipped that whole half year of high school, is, um, is equal to minus, gamma 2 is minus L squared over 2 phi twiddle times sine 2 phi. You don't need to know cosecant or anything like that. Okay, so uh, anyway, so that, that's the um, relationship between those two things. And what that means is, if you measure gamma 1 and gamma 2, you just take the Fourier transform of those things, right? And you form the following quantity. You take gamma 2 twiddle times, sorry, gamma, gamma 1 twiddle times cosine 2 phi L. This is all in, uh, in uh, L space. And that gives uh, phi cosine squared. And then you add gamma 1 twiddle times sine 2 phi L. And here's the, the last that I need to, need to know. Cosine squared plus sine squared is 1. So what you get is uh, equal to minus L squared over, you get uh, minus L squared over 2 phi twiddle, right? Which means you get kappa hat, kappa twiddle. So in other words, what does this mean? This is, this is tremendously important. I haven't yet giving you exactly why it's tremendously important, but it is, you're really a glimpse of it. You measure shapes, that gives you the shear, right? Shear doesn't sound that interesting, but you see that from the shear, so, sh so shapes give you shear, shear doesn't sound that interesting, but shear gives you kappa. And kappa is very interesting. And let me tell you why. Look at this, uh, look at that equation in real space. So kappa is equal to 1 half the derivative with respect to theta squared of phi. So this is the derivative, the, the second derivative with respect to theta squared of the, of the, the potential, which is, uh, I said it's 2, the integral um, from uh, d dl times dsl over dl times phi, the gravitational potential, right? Um, so the only where that this depends on theta is in, it comes in via dl theta, right? So you can switch the second term with respect to theta in terms of derivative with respect to dl, and what this is equal to is one half, oh, sorry, the, I guess the one half goes away, it's the integral d dl, and I guess there was a ds here, one over ds, d dl, the, D, the DL, when I convert this to a derivative with respect to DL, I have to multiply by DL squared. So I just get DSL DL. And then I get the actual physical Laplacian of the gravitational potential. And that, we know what that's equal to. It's 4 pi G times rho bar A squared delta. So what that means is kappa is equal to, so let me write this clearly, kappa of theta is equal to an integral of the over all lens distances from zero to the source of some window function which depends on the source and the distances of the over density evaluated at this standard position dl theta uh, dl so kappa is a mass map so and just to get the numbers right uh, d if you plug it in w this W of ds and dl is equal to dsl dl over ds times 4 pi g rho bar a squared, which you can just read off. Okay, so, so this, is a, this is a weighting function. 
which, which you know, just depends on distances. And, but it's a mass map. It's an integral of the density along the line of sight. So this is tremendously important. If you have, if you have a measurement of kappa, what you actually have is a, a map of the mass in the universe. That's important. So, so measuring shapes of galaxies can get you a, a really long, long way. Yeah? Ah, CMB, we're not there yet. You're ahead of me. You guys are always ahead of me. Yeah, and not, forget about CMB. We're, we're not there yet. Just look at, think of the shapes of a background galaxies. You know, Minot said, oh, there could be a, an intervening galaxy between us and them. Don't think that way anymore. Think of there's a fluctuating gravitational potential along the line of sight. Don't even think of objects. Just think of the mass distribution. It's not a single, it's not a single object. It's the diffuse distribution that's lensing things. So that, and that is what we have a measurement of. That, that's the measurement. You can, if you want to be, uh, if you want to make the newspaper, you say, oh, I saw a galaxy, or I saw a cluster. But that's not what we care about if we're interested in physics. What we're interested in is the mass distribution, and this gives us the mass distribution. Yeah. Why? Um, it's, it's, um, can you say it again? If the, something, so a galaxy is brighter than you thought? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> that further away than they sh or intrinsically are. It's, sorry. OK, yeah. So you have something that would ordinarily not be in your survey. It's, pr it's promoted into your survey because it's brightened. OK, go ahead. OK, OK, good, good. All right, so um, um, good. Who cares? Let's say, let's say that's true. Let's say that's true. L let's say that's true. Let's say you have a, a given redshift slice, right? And you have, instead, you would, if you were unlensed, you'd get 100 galaxies there. But you happen to be behind an overdense region. And as a result, what Caitlin says is you have more galaxies. But we don't care. Uh, what, what, what are we using those galaxies for? We're just using them to trace stuff, right? So what's going to happen? You're just going to get better, no better signal-to-noise estimates in those regions. OK, so, so, so that's the zeroth order answer. The first order answer is, I once wrote a paper about that and got it into nature. So it's actually a very important question. <laughs> the, um, so, the, so the thing is, it's true that, so what's going to end up happening is you're going to get better signal-to-noise behind regions that are more overdense, right? So if you imagine averaging over lots of different regions, you might imagine biasing yourself to getting more things. So it turns out you have to take that into account. So that's kind of a second order effect, but you do have to account for that. Although I don't think yet people have started to do, to do that. Yeah, but it's something that people are starting to think about, uh, uh, that w we've thought about, yeah. So, but it's. Yeah. So I don't understand. S say it again. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, but that's okay. Good, great, great. So now you're talking about another thing, a whole, another whole new field, which is what you're intrinsically saying is, let's say you measure the clustering of the background galaxies. It's going to impact the clustering of the background galaxies, right? Because you'll have more background galaxies behind overdense regions. But I wasn't talking about doing that measurement, but you're, you are, and, and people do that. So in fact, when you calc what we're doing now in DES is we're doing a combined it's called a, a combined probe analysis, one of lensing, which d doesn't suffer from that, but one of clustering. 
So when you take into account the clustering of the background galaxies, you have to account for precisely that effect. And you can also, yeah, so, so you, can, you, have to, you have to put that into a whole machinery thing. So, yeah, so you're absolutely right. That's an effect that you have to, you have to worry about. Yeah, exactly. Good, yeah. So, you can, I mean, you can kind of see you're all kind of, um, you're, you're, you're kind of getting, getting out from me the fact that things are, are more complicated than they first, so this is a, kind of the simple picture, but things are more complicated when you start to do stuff. And that's what we're doing right now within the Dark Energy Survey. And that's why I find it so interesting is that we're having to deal with all these kinds of effects. It's, it's, it's a pretty interesting uh, time. Yeah. Question? Other question? Okay. Um, now what we'd like to do is we have a fluctuating quantity. And, you know, it's going to be, kappa is going to be plus over there, minus over there, plus over there, right? So what do we like to do with that? We'd like to take the power spectrum of it, right? And I can write that down now in one line. So the power spectrum of kappa is just equal to the integral uh, of, the, up, of the distance times this window function squared divided by dl squared times the power spectrum, evaluated at l over dl. And I can do that because this is the limber form. It's the exact same thing we did yesterday, right? The only difference between this expression and the one I wrote down next yesterday is there was a dn dz there, a dn dd there, right? This, this is just a different window function. Exact, we don't have to do, go through the algebra. It's the exact same thing. We automatically have an expression for the power spectrum, right? It's, that's why the limber thing is so beautiful. So this tells you what, you what you expect, that if you can measure the shapes, you can therefore measure the power spectrum of the convergence, and therefore get a handle on what the power spectrum is, which is, again, what, where all the cosmology lies. OK, so let me just give you a rough, um, let's, get, let's give an example. If we're sitting over here, um, so Again, let's not, not worry so much about uh, the clustering, which, as Caitlin points out, is another handle on things. But uh, imagine you, you're just measuring shapes. So you, you, from each of the, you, you have background galaxies at this redshift, in this redshift bin, back, galaxies in this redshift bin, you measure the shapes of each of them. You infer the gamma field, and you take the Fourier transform of it, you get kappa, and then you make a mass map. So then from this, there are then three spectra there's C L, you know, one one, C L one two, and C L two two. There are three different spectrum, right? And and we have the exact so the, the intuition that you've built up about CLs now we can just import to this um, to this problem. So the, um, the thing to plot would be uh, L squared CL over 2 pi. This is degree scales. This is you know, 10 arc minute scales. And roughly speaking, um, The, the ones from the redshift bins that are close to us, say redshift 0.5, say, uh, look something like this. And so this would be the 1-1 one, one spectrum. And the one that's uh, from further away, the further away you are, the more structure there is. So the more you get lens. So it makes sense that you get more deflection. So that looks something like this for the 2-2 two, two thing. And then the 1-2 one, thing is somewhere in between. Okay. So this is quantitatively the way we do it. We, we calculate the, it's called tomography. But um, qualitatively, going back to this picture, what you should see is the, um, the structure that we see from the, the, the kappa we measure from this slice, right, tells us something about the structure over here, right? The kappa we measure from this slice tells us something about all the structure in between us and that, right? 
S and then, and so that means by taking these the, these two spectra, or these three spectra, we can infer how much structure there is here and how much structure there is here. So we can we can assess how rapidly uh, structure the 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 large scale structure of the universe is growing with time. Yeah. You mean in time? Oh, but I don't think I agree with you because um, remember we did yesterday. Which are the modes that are contributing? Yeah. So, so we're getting a handle on the growth of structure. Again, only some subset of the Fourier modes, but still those, those Fourier modes. We don't, we don't care which Fourier modes because the power spectrum just depends on the magnitude. So we're just using some of them, but that's okay. And we are indeed getting information about how the power spectrum evolves with time. And that, and again, people think about W, so if you parameterize it with W, you get constraints on W. But I urge you to think about it a slightly, in a more agnostic way. That is, think about it as the, the, you know, the, the way that the universe expands with time, the way that the distance redshift measurements that supernova and BAO allow, that is one class of measurements. That measures you know, how fast the universe is expanding. This is another class of measurements. This is measuring how rapidly structure grows, how rapidly grows. And G, you know, GR and Friedman's equation and, and make predictions for both, but, it turn, it, but, but they're two separate classes of measurements. And the reason why it's so interesting, it's, I, I like thinking about it that way, is um, there's this nice plot in a paper by Hooterer et al. that shows the following. You plot the growth, what's called the growth function, which I think we talked about, as a function of redshift. So then, uh, I don't know, it doesn't matter which way this is going, but the, the, the standard model, lambda CDM, has some, looks something like this, makes a prediction. And then we're projected to get roughly percent level er error bars from upcoming surveys. You can put on the same plot other models, models of uh, modified gravity, like DGP or, or F of R. And they tend to make different predictions. And the thing I really like about this plot is each one of these models, uh, I'm, I'm drawing a cartoon, but look in the paper by Hooterer, each from, from, I guess, 2013, 13, probably 09 or something. So that each one of these um, models, so these are modified gravity models, and this is the prediction of lambda CDM with the projected error bars from an experiment. Each one of these models predicts the exact same expansion history. That is, it would fit the supernova data, it would fit the BAO data, but they make much different predictions for how rapidly structure grows. So this is, this, that's why I think just make, making a measurement of the growth of structure is very important because we don't really have a good alternative model, so we, we need to make measurements that we can actually, you know, that, that will lead us to the, to the right way of thinking about things. Okay. Questions about that? Yeah. Ah, okay, good, good, good. Um, oh, oh, well, Lyman Alpha is a 3D thing, and it's not lensing. Oh, okay, good. Um, right, so lensing is a 2D thing, and it, it suffers, well, that's not 100% true. So people think about lensing as a 3D thing, a 2D thing, but that, it's possible, so this is a, a research thing that I don't think anyone's looked at. Uh, the reason why people do that is because historically the experiments, and in the future, the experiments that can resolve shapes of galaxies, they take a long time to measure the shapes of galaxies, so you know, to, to, me to have the resolution to do it. So for example, DAISY, that spectroscopic thing, will not measure the shapes of galaxies. And LSST, which is this, you know, will measure shapes of galaxies really well, will not get spectra of things. So that's why people historically have thought of lensing as a 2D thing where you coarsely bin things, right? So what you're suggesting is in some futuristic uh, world where you get spectra for those galaxies for which you get shape, lensing is really not a 2D thing. It's really the, um, the shear as a function of redshift, right, 
um, you could imagine correlating, making it a 3D thing. And that way you're not throwing away the limber, the, you're not doing the limber thing. So I 100% agree with you, that, but I don't think anyone's, anyone's worked that out. Other questions? Okay. Um, all right, so let's conclude by talking about CMB lensing. I know Nalima uh, talked about this, but I don't think she walked through the, um, the formula. So I want to, and also this, it's, it's directly related to this, so it's kind of a, it's a nice segue. Okay, so um, so first, to, let, I need two two. Um, so this is, I think five, maybe four. I don't know. Anyway, CMB lensing. That was supposed to be four. Anyway, CMB lensing. Okay, so there are two heuristic things you have to know. The um, we just said that. Kappa RMS as a function of scale. Remember the um, remember we did this calculation a couple of days ago that delta squared, the variance of a field, is the integral logarithmic integral over L times or, or k in that case k cubed p of k over two pi squared. Or in angular space, the um, the uh, RMS of kappa is going to be equal to the logarithmic integral over L times L squared C L kappa kappa over 2 pi. That is, the, um, the RMS gets contributions from all scales, right? And this combination gives you the, contribu the contribution. RMS means root mean square, means the amount it's, it's, if you just take the square of it, this is just equal to uh, kappa at a given position squared averaged over all positions to the 1 half power. Okay, so so that that's what kappa RMS squared is, right? And and what do we know? So what this plot immediately tells you what uh, what kappa R, what kappa RMS is. Roughly speaking, kappa squared is ten to the minus four. So the conversions of what are ten to the minus two? So we're looking for percent level effects, right? Because this is the square root of that is the RMS. Does, does ever, is everyone with me so far? Because I'm about to make it more complicated now. You got that? So kappa is the rough, this is a stand-in for the variance. The uh, root mean square is the square root of the variance. The variance is 10 to the minus 4. The RMS fluctuations then are 10 to the minus 2 in the convergence. Okay. The convergence, remember, is the derivative of the, is the, is the, is the, is the, is the derivative of the, of the derivative of the potential. The derivative of the potential was the deflection angle was beta minus theta, right? So the, um, the convergence, and let's just do this heuristically, was the derivative of the deflection angle. Let's call this alpha, the deflection angle. The, the, amount by w the angle by which beta is not equal to theta, and we had a fancy expression for it, you know, in terms of the gradient of the potential, but that's what it is, it's the deflection angle, right? So the, the, the kappa is the derivative of the deflection angle with respect to theta, right? Forgetting about indices and stuff like that. So what that means is, the in in L space, the deflect. Wh what I'm trying to get at is, what is the RMS deflection angle? How much is the stuff deflected as it passes through the long line of sight? And we can do that because, roughly speaking, so alpha RMS, the deflect, the, the RMS deflection angle squared, is equal to L squared. CL alpha alpha over 2 pi, right? That's just our standard formula. And CL alpha alpha, but alpha is, uh, actually, if you go back to our notes, th there's a factor of 2 here. So this is uh, 2. So this is, um, roughly speaking, and, and the, the CLs are, are the square of it. So this is, um, sorry. So th this tells you that alpha goes as um, kappa 2 kappa over L, right? 
in Fourier space. When I take the Fourier space, this brings down an L, so L alpha, L over two alpha. So this is two, so alpha twiddle is two kappa over L. So that means, let me just finish for a second. So that means the power spectrum of this is equal to four C L squared C L kappa kappa over two pi. Um, divided by L divided by L squared. Do you have a question? This thing? Yeah. It's the power spectrum of of the deflection angle. Deflection angle is also varying in corner space. You just do the same thing. Okay. So what does this mean? What is the RMS? Therefore, what is the RMS deflection angle? So roughly speaking, it's two. This thing we said is about 10 to the minus 4. And, and taking the square root of it, so it's to the 1 half, over L. So this is roughly of order. And, and, and so one, one other thing. Because if you plotted this thing, the deflection angle, if you plotted L squared CL alpha alpha over 2 pi over L, it's, it's down weighted from kappa kappa by 1 over L squared. So it's more heavily weighted towards um, low L. So if this is our 100 and this is our 1,000, it actually peaks at around L of 50, and then it falls off. It's more heavily weighted. You just take that thing and divide by L squared. And you can actually get the amplitude from that. I, I, I'm going to cease putting in numbers. But the amplitude is about 10 to the minus uh, 7 or so. So what does this mean? It's fascinating. If you take the square root of this thing, then you get a number which is about an arc, one arc minute. So just plug in numbers, and uh, what you'll find is, so this is about 10 to the minus 2 divided by 50, which is about, uh, and then 2 divided by 20, so that's 25, 20, so 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3, say. 10 to the minus 3 is roughly an arc minute, or a few arc minutes or something like that. That is how much each photon from the CMB is, de or, or from distant galaxies, are deflected from us. So when we see a galaxy over there, it's not really over there, it's over there. So that's a really interesting fact. But the other interesting fact is that um, the, the deflection is caused by large-scale structure on, on, on you know, several degree scales at L50. So, um, so the photons in the CMB are deflected By very large scale structure, you know, of order, you know, a few degrees on the sky, which is, which is about a uh, hundred megaparsec or so, and uh, by, by an amount, by about, by about one arc minute, by a very small, by a small amount on the sky. So that's that's an interesting fact. So this point was made qualitatively by a beautiful four page article in two thousand and one, Wayne Wayne who who uh, explained everything we're about to do. OK, so that's the first qualitative point. And the second qualitative point is, um, has to do with what do you think lensing is going to do to the CMB? OK, well, we actually know that. Cause so, so you know what the CMB power spectrum looks like? Right, you know this. So imagine measuring the small scale power, an L of, of a, 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 you know, an arc minute or so, a few arc minutes or so, down here in the damping tail, measuring in a given region in the sky. And imagine in that region of the sky, kappa, due to the large scale structure, is positive. So what's going to happen? That, that everything is going to expand, right? So that means that all of these peaks are going to move to larger scales. So if you have, um, if you have a cap, if you have, if you, the power behind a region with, um, with uh, positive kappa is going to be different. Uh, it's going to be shifted. So that's kappa greater than zero. And kappa less than zero is going to be the other way around. So essentially the power is going to be different in different regions in the sky. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's heuristically, that's heuristically what we do. But let's now do it with algebra, which is, at least for me, the simplest way of, uh, of understanding it. 
Sorry? Yeah, but it's like, exactly, yeah. Shift, it's, the whole spectrum is shifted over a little bit behind a region with, po with positive convergence. So what that means is if you measure the difference between the, the power in different places, you can infer the convergence, right? Because the power is going to be bigger in one place and smaller than another place. If you measure that difference, then in each place you can figure out what the convergence is. That, so that's what CMB lensing is. So let me do it in a way that's slightly more mathematical. So the temperature as a, position of, as a function of position on the sky is equal to the unlensed position on the sky, uh, temper, sorry, temperature, evalu uh, evaluated at the, so this is the observed temperature at the observed angle. It's equal to the unlensed temperature at an angle theta minus, I guess what I called, uh, so the gradient of the potential, which is the deflection angle, right? So in other words, if you, the, the observed angle, we, we observe, the temperature we observe it to be at is the unlensed temperature at this other angle. Does that make sense? So if you tailor expand that, what you means is it's equal to the unlensed temperature at theta minus the derivative of the unlensed temperature with respect to theta dot into the derivative of the projected potential with respect to theta, and then et cetera, et cetera. So when you take the um, Fourier transform of this, you get the observed temperature. This is the thing whose square gives you the CLs, right? The, the CMB CLs. So the observed temperature is equal to the, um, the, un, the unlensed temperature. And then, um, oh, sorry. So I think you know this, um, so I, I won't do this. The, the, um, when you have a product in real space, it turns into a convolution in Fourier space, right? So you can work it out just by taking the Fourier transform of each. But what it, what it ends up to be is there's two, there's two uh, derivatives respect to theta that brings down I squared, so that kills the minus sign. So it's plus an integral D2 L prime. There's a T unlensed of L prime. And then it's a convolution, so it's phi twiddle of L minus L prime. And then the derivatives bring down a factor of L prime dotted into L minus L prime. Do you agree? Questions? So if you were to um, include this next order term, what you would find is, um, uh, whatever. Anyway, so, th so this, is what you, this is what you do when you get this term. OK, so now let's do what we've been doing all along. We don't care about, um, we don't care about the thing at any one particular Fourier mode or one particular thing in the sky. We care about the statistics of it. So let's calculate t twiddle of L t twiddle of L prime. And I guess let's take the Fourier transform. And let's take the average over all of the whole ensemble of the distribution of the CMB temperature, keeping phi fixed. So let's keep phi fixed, but let's take different realizations of the CMB temperature, plop it down, take the ensemble average of that for a given fixed phi field. So you're going to get, there's, you know, there's, there's four terms. There's this term cross this term. This second order term turns itself, which doesn't count, which, I, which, which we'll neglect. And then there's the cross term. Right? These two cross terms are the same, so it's just a factor of two. So we only have to calculate two terms. One is the zeroth order term, but that's trivial. That's just equal to 2 pi squared delta 2 of L minus L prime times the CLs. And I won't even give them a TT because they're so famous that, you know, there's the CL. Those are the CLs, right? Those are the CMB CLs. They don't need a subscript. A superscript. Okay, good. So those are the CLs. They're not CL kappa kappa. They're the ones that, that, that made money. Okay, so now the cross correlation is the one that we're interested in. The cross correlation, remember, is a factor of two. So we can take, say, this one to be, uh, this one to be um, the, the zeroth order thing, and this one to be the first order. Can we just put a factor of two into it? So it's plus. 
and let's take all the stuff that's not fluctuating out. So it's an integral d2 l prime, l, I have to be careful here because the l prime here is not this dummy integral. So, ah, so let's call this, um, all right, let's just be careful. So let's call this l double prime, because you'll have to correct me, over 2 pi squared. Everywhere here, let's cap, cap with the t we're going to cap in front. So it's phi twiddle of the L here is really L prime, so it's L prime minus L double prime. And this thing is L double prime dotted into L prime minus L double prime. So that's this whole piece. And then the only remaining thing is to take the expectation value of this thing, which is T twiddle of L. Oh, and I think we took the, four, the complex conjugate of this. That's too bad. And the, um, the, so they have the t twiddle of L. And then we have this t twiddle, and this is the unlensed t. And then we have this one, which is L double prime. So it's t twiddle unlensed complex conjugate of L double prime, right? We know what this is. This is 2 pi squared L minus L double prime CL. Right? So, this term gets rid of the L double prime thing. So we can get rid of the L double prime thing and just replace it by L. So it's equal to phi twiddle of L prime minus L. L double prime is L. So it's L dotted into L prime minus L times CL, the CL. And here's the beauty of the whole thing. There's a delta function here, which is what you normally expect, right? Only modes with the same thing. There's no delta function here. So different L modes are correlated by this lensing. So this goes back to what I was trying to say, I'm in so much trouble the first time, that if there is, the universe is not, if the, I, I don't, whatever. If it's not the same in every place, right? And I, I, physically, remember I said the power is different than there. If it's not the same in every place, then you're going to get correlations between different L modes. And what's breaking it, what's making it not the same in every place? The gravitational potential, which is different, which is varying across the sky, right? So that is going to lead to non-zero correlations between different L modes that wouldn't be there otherwise. So what that means is, is a trivial thing we can do. We can make an estimator for, um, we can make an estimator for the gravitational potential along the line of sight. Or, you know, but now you're comfortable enough knowing that that's the same thing as a mass map. Because you can go back and forth between that and kappa. So we can make a mass map with the CMB by just measuring the CMB, the correlations between different L modes in the CMB. So a simple estimator is just to take, let me, um, let me define capital L to be L prime minus L. So a simple estimator for the Fourier transform of the gravitational potential, a hat means an estimator, of, uh, of capital L is equal to, you take the Fourier transform of the observed um, microwave background temperature you, at a given uh, Fourier mode. You multiply it by the Fourier transform conjugate at a different mode, L prime equal to a little l plus a capital L. If, 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 if things were normal, this would be zero for all non-zero capital L, right? But things are not normal, and, that, and that's what the gravitational potential is. And then you just divide by um, L dotted into capital L times CL. That would be a very simple estimator. Let me ask you a question. 
How big is little L and how big is capital L? You're in four, you're doing Fourier space, you're combining different, four, different Fourier modes. Uh, in, in Fourier space, so let me draw one of them. So this is, say, L. What's the other one look like? Slide? Okay, so that if it was perpendicular, that, mean ca that would mean capital L would be of the same order of magnitude as little l. That would mean the thing doing the lensing would be at the same scale as the distortions. Right? That would mean ca the magnitude of, let's say, of l, little l was 1,000, capital L was also 1,000, it was perpendicular, right? And that would mean the, um, the, le the scale of the lensing of the structures doing the lensing would be the same size as the scale of the deflection. Right. So, so what? So what? What's another? What, what's another way of thinking about? Good. So the the thing is, the lensing is done by large scale structure, but where capital is very small. So what you're doing is you're taking four modes that are very close to one another. Right. And, 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 and you're looking at them, they're not the same, but they're very close to one another, and that enables the, di and the, um, the, 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 the product of those two would normally fluctuate to be zero, but in this case, because of lensing, you get, um, you get this thing. So for example, if you wanted to, what you could do is, if you just wanted phi magnitude L, you could just take a given L vector and look at all the modes in this circle, right, around that capital L. And that, and that would give you, um, that would give you uh, the, uh, the amplitude. And so you can plot the power spectrum, for example, CL phi phi, which is just going to be, this is a quadratic estimator. That would be a fourth order in the, in the, uh, in the temperature. People have done that. You've probably seen that. Did, did Bill Lima show you this? People have this, and you know, it does indeed look something like, like, something like that. Yeah. Why? Where does it break down? Uh, what? Oh, because no, I'm not saying no. The, no, you're saying that this would be uh, small. No, no. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, okay, okay. Good, good. Okay, good point. So, what? So, what, what is your name again? I didn't hear you. So uh, whatever. What you said, uh, uh, Christi Christian, sorry. So what Christian just said is uh, for, for low L, you know, this denominator is potentially small. And that raises the question that, remember, this is the signal. But go back to, I think you were you the one who asked the exact same question with lensing. There's going to be noise in the CMB thing, right? So if you're weighting it by a small number, you're amplifying the noise. So this is an estimator, but it's a terrible estimator. And so what Wayne Hu did in his 2001 paper is he figured out what the optimal estimator was. that had the minimum variance. So you're absolutely right that this is not the best way to estimate it. What you want to do is you want to weight things appropriately. But basically, fundamentally, it's still this thing. So it's, it's this still thing. So it's a good point, but, it, but it's, uh, it's, it doesn't invalidate the whole basic idea. OK, let me just, other questions about this? OK, so thinking about. Putting things together, let me just tell you in the last 30 seconds what I'm working on, which is in, in, we have a maps in this dark energy survey that overlap with maps from the South Pole Telescope. So from the dark energy survey, we've talked about making maps of the galaxy over density. And we've also take, talked about making maps of the shapes that give you maps of kappa, or let's call it gamma. And, 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 and so you can imagine, as, K as Caitlin pointed out, taking this two-point function, this two-point function, and the cross two-point function. So that's three two-point functions and combining that information. And by the way, each of these things is in different tomographic bins. So you're now getting up to you know, 20 two-point functions. 
And then from SBT, we have these kappa maps. So you cross-correlate it with these things. So basically what we're up to is, uh, and then you know, and each one of these things has you know, 10 L bins or something like that. So we have a data vector, which is about the size of 1,000. Basically, you know, three different tomographic bins for each of these things, all the different cross-correlations in many different L bins. So, you know, you guys have already mentioned some of the issues making theoretical predictions. Other issues are getting the covariance matrix for a thousand uh, element data vector. It means you have to get a thousand by a thousand covariance matrix. That's a lot of elements. So that's very hard. You have to worry about intrinsic alignments. You have to worry about photometric redshift errors. You have to measure, mo figure out how to measure shapes of galaxies. And then you have to figure out how two collaborations uh, talk to one another. So it's really a challenging, but uh, it's a very, pretty exciting uh, set of, suite of problems. That's it. Thanks. R squared, yeah. Oh, R squared times. Yeah. yeah, because remember, C went fold off as one over R squared. Yeah. Okay, so if I had yeah. plot it like that, it would be hard to show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still getting used to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah.